He did a great job. We very much appreciate Danton stepping in at the last minute to lead singing today. As you know, Billy is sick, and uh, hopefully and prayerfully he'll be feeling better and be back with us very soon. I know that he wanted to be here today, but we understand. We're glad Connie's here today, and we, I'm sure he's watching as, uh, well, maybe not. <laughs> gotcha. He's got good intentions. But anyway, we're glad you're here, and we're glad that we have the opportunity to be here to worship God this hour. We appreciate so much your presence. We do have a lot of folks that are sick, some who are traveling, and we want to be mindful of them. We've got a lot of, a lot of people coming and going, and so please remember all of them in your prayers. We are looking today at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 and verses 1 through 16. In our study today, we're going to talk about the challenge of a believer. It is a challenge to live the Christian life, isn't it? It's a challenge because of the world in which we live. And the devil is doing everything that he can to distract and disrupt our lives, isn't he? And so to stay focused on Christ and to remember that we are blessed above the rest in so many ways. And to recognize that when all is said and done, there's something greater that lies ahead. It's called heaven. And that's our goal. We want to go to heaven. And so in our study today, we want to think for a minute or two about the challenge of a believer. And to those of us who are trying to live the Christian life, we know it is a challenge, isn't it? It's a challenge every day. It's not an insurmountable challenge, but nonetheless, it is a challenge. I want to begin by, first of all, noting with you the position of a believer. And Paul here addresses this idea that those of us who belong to God, we enjoy an exalted position in Christ Jesus. And as we look at Colossians 3, verse 1, the first thing he's going to talk about is the fact that we have been delivered from sin. So listen to him. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Those of us who have been raised with Christ, obviously we talk about our obedience to the gospel, the fact that we died to the love and the practice of sin, that we have, as Paul would say to the church at Rome, been raised to walk in newness of life. As a result of our obedience to the gospel, first and foremost, we are forgiven people, aren't we? There's something special about being forgiven. There are a lot of us that understand the fact that when it's all said and done, we really don't deserve forgiveness, do we? Do you think the Apostle Paul understood? And Paul is writing to saints in Colossae. He's writing to people that have been raised with Christ. Some of those folks had been living in sin. They had been living in, as we would say, the muck and the mire of sin. And yet they had been raised to walk in a, new, in a newness of life. And so in Colossians 1 verse 14, Paul would say that it's in Him that we have forgiveness or redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins. To know that all of our sins have been washed away, that we don't have to meet our past again. I think about the lives of some people and the fact that through the cleansing power of the blood of Christ, they are not what they once were. As a matter of fact, all of us who have obeyed the gospel, we are not what we once were, right? You know, the Bible says... In Acts chapter 22 at verse 16, with regard to the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, that he had been instructed to arise and wash away his sins. Saul of Tarsus was a blasphemer and a persecutor. And yet in 1 Timothy chapter 1 at verse 15, he would say, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Listen to him of whom I am chief. 
If anybody knew something about the power of God's forgiveness, it was Paul, wasn't it? Do you remember the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 8? At verse 12 said, speaking of the forgiveness that we enjoy in Christ, he said, I will be merciful to your unrighteousness. And then he said, your sins and your iniquities, I will remember no more. Do you think that was important to Paul? To know that all the things that he had done in the past, people that he had persecuted, some that he had had put to death, do you think it was important to him to know that, you know what, my past is behind me? There's something to be said about forgiveness. And the beauty of Christianity, the message that we're trying to convey to a lost and dying world is, doesn't matter what your past is, you can be forgiven. And so I think about our forgiveness in Christ, but then also the fact that we have a family in Christ. Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. He wrote to those who were identified as saints and faithful brethren. This idea of being brothers and sisters in Christ. John said that God is our Father, isn't He, according to 1 John chapter 3? Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the sons or the children of God. Aren't you grateful to have a church family? I know a family right now, not in this city, and they're facing a lot of problems. And, and when it's all said and done, really it's just the two of them. They don't have a church family to minister to them, to help them, to encourage them, to pray for them. And you think about as a child of God, and, and as we think about the scope of our blessings, we've been delivered from sin, and we've been forgiven in Christ, and we have become a part of the family of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, Paul said that we are a part of the household of God. To the church at Ephesus, Paul would say, look, you're no longer strangers and foreigners. He said, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We are a church family. And so as a result of that, we have a sense of togetherness. There's a bond. We are people of like precious faith. So our position in Christ, first, we've been delivered in Christ. But then secondly, Paul says, not only are we delivered from sin, but we are dead to sin. Look again at what Paul said. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Look at verse 3 if you would. He said, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. The idea of dying to that old way of life, we do that through repentance, don't we? Paul talks about in Colossians chapter 1 how we are delivered out of the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. There is a translation that takes place when we become a child of God. We are literally plucked out of the world and placed in a divine body. It's called the church. There is a translation that takes place. The new birth affords us a new beginning, which brings with it new blessings. One of those blessings is that we are now a part of, as I said a moment ago, of God's family. There's a translation, but not just a translation, but a transformation. We're changed people, aren't we? So that old way of life has been put to death. You remember the Apostle Paul would say to the church, churches of Galatia? He said, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom... The world has been crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Paul, all Paul's saying there is, look, I've died to that old way of life. I'm not a persecutor. I'm not a murderer. I'm not blaspheming the cause of Jesus any longer. I'm a changed person. So with that in mind, we talk about this transformation. And to every child of God, listen to what Paul said. You remember when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth? He was writing to some folks that had been living very wicked and sinful lives. And yet, in spite of their past, here's what he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
If any man be in Christ, that's the scope of God's invitation. Any person can change. Any person can be changed. And so he said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. And so he would say, behold, all things have become new. So in light of that, listen to what he said beginning in verse 5. Therefore, in light of the fact that you've been raised with Christ, you've died to sin, put to death. That's the hard part, isn't it? That's one of the challenges of being a child of God. Put to death your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you also once walked when you lived in them. Paul's saying, look, this is how you used to live. This was characteristic of your life prior to becoming a Christian. He he said, but you need to also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. There's some changes that take place. Why? Because we're transformed people. We're different. We don't think like we used to. We don't act like we used to. We belong to somebody else. We belong to God, don't we? And so he said, do not lie to one another since you put off the old man with his deeds. And you put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is in all and all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. All right, here's the new man. There's been a change that's taken place in the life of a believer. And so this change is reflected in a lifestyle. And so he said, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are also called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And so Paul here emphasizing, number one, a translation has occurred. We have been delivered out of the power of darkness, translated into the church, into the kingdom of God's dear love, and we are transformed people. We're not what we used to be. It's evidenced by what? By how we live, by how we act, by how we interact. Now there's a second thing I want you to see. First, we talk about our position in Christ, but secondly, our priority in Christ. And really, this is where the rubber meets the road, as we say. This is the real challenge in life. And first of all, what Paul says is, as a a child of God, as a Christian, we are automatically thrust into the arena of conflict. He talks about the fact that, look, we have a conflict in Christ. What's the conflict? We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're living among people who are in the world, who are acting like the world. Our challenge is to somehow rise above that. So listen to what he says. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Now look at verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. So what about this conflict in Christ? Well, first of all, there is what I would call the pull of the world. Do you feel the world tugging at you daily? Does the world pull you day to day? Sure it does. Look, the devil is in the business of enticing, isn't he? The devil's doing everything within his power to entice us and ensnare us. How does he do that? Well, he does it through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. The devil has got a lot of tools in this toolbox, doesn't he? I admire people that have the ability to do a lot of different things in life. 
Some of you are very mechanically minded. And you understand that there are certain jobs, certain tasks that require a lot of tools. Look, the devil has a lot of tools. And so he's going to tug at us daily. He's going to be pulling at us to the various tools or baits that he uses. So what about that? I remember some years ago I had lunch with a fella. He had been a former Tennessee state legislator. He was a very powerful man, a wealthy man. And he said, when I went to Nashville, he said, as a matter of fact, not only when I went to Nashville, but he said, everyone who goes to Nashville as a legislator, he said, the first thing people want to know is this. What do you like? And really what they're trying to do is buy you, aren't they? What is it you like? Is it money? He said, is it, is it women? Is it alcohol? You tell me what it is that you like, and guess what? We'll furnish. Is that not how the devil operates today? Doesn't he walk about, as Peter said, as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour? The constant pull of the devil. Those who are, li who are trying to live the Christian life, those of us who are trying to live for God, there is this constant day-by-day -day pull of the world. Now I want to add with that, not just the pull of the world, but the philosophy of the world, because they're intertwined. What about this philosophy of the world? What is it that the devil is selling that makes people think, you know what, I need some of that. I want some of that. Well, do you remember back in Luke chapter 12 when Jesus taught a parable about a rich farmer? Business was booming. He had everything. Matter of fact, he felt like he was self-sufficient. There are a lot of folks in our world today, you'll hear them say, I have pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. Read about a fellow just the other day, a billionaire, stepped out into eternity, done a lot of great things in this world, built a lot of important relationships in this world. His name etched in stone in certain places in this country. If I called his name, you'd know him. Many of you would know him. But he died. And all that money and all the power and all the prestige that went along with his various dealings in life, all of that gone behind him. And really the question is, I know he had a lot of treasure here, but what kind of treasure did he have on the other side? Do you remember what Jesus asked? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The rich farmer, he had everything. There are a lot of folks in our world today, they have, they've got good health. They've got a good job. They live in a beautiful home. They drive a nice automobile. They've got everything. But sometimes just because you have everything doesn't mean you have really anything of substance. So this rich farmer, his, his business is booming. So he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull down my barns and build greater. And he said, I'll, I'll then store all my crops and goods. And I'll say, so you've got many goods laid up for many years. Eat, drink, and be merry. That was his attitude, wasn't it? Is that not the philosophy of the world? In other words, enjoy it while you can. You better get it while you're here. Don't worry about it. The problem with this fellow was he was rich in the world, but he didn't have any treasure on the other side. That's the pull of the world. That's the philosophy of the world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul makes a case for the resurrection. He points out that the resurrection of Jesus is valid because he was seen by any number of eyewitnesses. And he says, in effect, look, if there is no resurrection, our preaching is vain, our faith is vain. He said, look, we're still in sin. So then in verse 32, here's what he said about the resurrection. If there is no resurrection, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Is that not the philosophy, philosophy of the world? I mean, why are you worried about eternity? Why are you worried about tomorrow? Live it up today. That's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to get so caught up in the world 
but you forget about your soul. Who's he attacking? Christians. That's why Peter said we've got to withstand him steadfast in the soul. So there is this constant conflict in Christ. We're at war. That's what Paul said. And with regard to that war, what the devil's trying to do is buy up real estate in your life. I don't know how many of you have Bermuda grass at home, but you know that if, if you don't treat that Bermuda grass, it'll, it will be overtaken by weeds, won't it? So you got to have it, you got to have your lawn treated regularly. If you don't treat that lawn over a period of time, what will happen? Those weeds will take over, won't they? What Paul tells us is if we do not allow the Lord to reign and rule in our lives, the devil will buy up real estate. Just like weeds will overtake your lawn, the devil will overtake your life. That's why he said in Ephesians chapter 4, neither give place to the devil. The word place there is the word from which we get our term topography. All he's saying is, don't let the devil get your real estate. That is, get in your life. Because he wants to get a foothold in your life, and once he gets in, he's going to stay in, isn't he? So what about our consecration to Christ? Listen now to what Paul said. He said, here's what you need to do. Set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with God, or rather hidden with Christ in God. And then in verse 4 he said, When Christ, who is our life. You know what Paul's saying here? He's saying that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the sole aim or focal point of our life. That's what he's saying. Now we talk about our aim and our allegiance in Christ. Is Jesus the aim of your life? And have you given Him your allegiance? You want to know how to test that? Turn over to John chapter 21. You remember when Jesus confronted Peter after He had denied Him three times? You remember that occasion? Jesus face to face with Simon Peter. And He said, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Now, there are different words that are used for love in the, Greek, in the Greek language. The highest form of love is agape love. It's that self-serving, sacrificial type of love. So what Jesus is asking Peter is this, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me more than anything? Do you love me more than everything? And you remember what Peter said? Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. But he didn't use the same word. Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Do you agape me? Peter, however, used the word for like. And so he said, Lord, you know I like you. So Jesus asked him again, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And how did Peter answer again? You know what he said? Peter didn't say, Lord, you know I agape you. He said, Lord, you know I like you. Now sometimes we say our aim is on Christ. And that we have a strong and abiding allegiance to Christ. But if the Lord were to ask us, do you agape me? Do you love me more than anything? What would we say? Is it possible we would say, Lord, I like you. I, I like you, Lord, but I don't like you enough to be involved in your work. I like you, Lord, but I don't love you enough to, to come back on Sunday night or Wednesday night. I like you, Lord, but I don't like you enough to teach others about you. You see, there's a difference in demonstrating day in, day out, agape love. And that love that is defined by likeness. I like you. You know, I like, I like the benefits and the blessings of Christianity, but I'm really not all in. 
You know the beauty of Christianity? Either you're all in or you're all out. There's no middle ground, is there? Didn't Jesus say, he that is not with, he that is not with me is against me. So what about that? What about our aim, our allegiance? Remember what, do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33? Listen to him. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Before anything else. How do we know if we're seeking first the Lord before anything else? Well, is it not demonstrated by how we live? Is it not demonstrated in how we conduct ourselves day in and day out? You know, we talk about being transformed by the renewing of our mind. The idea is we're different. Why are we different? Because of who we are and because of whose we are. We belong to the Lord, don't we? So listen to Paul. Paul said, look, you were bought with a price. Because you were bought with a price, here's what I want you to do. I want you to glorify God in your body and in your spirit. And here's why. Because He owns you. He would say, which are His. God owns us. And so God wants our, He wants our, He wants our lives to be totally committed to Him. He is our aim in life. He is our allegiance in life. Here's Paul. Listen to Paul. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Could we say that? Could we say that it's all about Jesus? That's what Paul said, Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. He said, Christ is our life. Do you remember in Philippians 1, 21, Paul said, to live is Christ. What do you mean, Paul? Paul is simply saying this. If you want to know what my life's all about, let me tell you, it's about Jesus. He is my everything. Is He your everything? Third thing I want to share with you very quickly, a couple of minutes left. And that is our promise in Christ. We have the promise of Christ's coming. Think for a minute or two about what Paul says in verse 4 again. When Christ, who is our life, appears. Did you know that there is coming a day in which we will see Jesus at the time of His coming? Think for a minute about what John said, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, He comes with the clouds, listen to Him, and every eye shall see Him. Can you imagine that? The Lord Jesus Christ coming in the clouds, and every eye shall see Him. John said, and they also who pierced Him. The Roman soldier that took that sword and thrust it into the side of Jesus. Do you think he really believed that he was piercing the side of God's only begotten Son? And John said, I want you to know something. There's coming a day in which that Roman soldier, he'll see my son come in glory. So, the Lord Jesus will be seen at the time of His coming, and He will be seated on the throne. He'll be seated on the throne at the time of His coming. How do I know that? Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, when the Son of Man comes with all of His holy angels, He will be seated upon the throne of His glory. He's talking there about the judgment. Are you ready for the judgment? Did you know there's coming a day in which every knee will bow, every tongue shall confess to God? How many times, how many times have we talked about the judgment seat of Christ? But how many times in our discussion of the judgment seat of Christ have we personally thought about the fact that individually we will stand before Him? And as Paul said, give an account of the deeds done in the body. So I think about the promise of Christ coming. But then what about the promise to all who are in Christ at His coming? Listen to what, listen to what Paul said, when Christ who is our life appears then you also will appear with Him in glory. When Jesus comes, we're going to be with the Savior and with the saints in glory forevermore. How many times 
have you read about Jesus in the Bible? You go back to the Old Testament and you read about that coming Messiah. The one Isaiah called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. How many times have you read Matthew and Mark and John and Luke and their accounts of the life of Jesus? We've read about Jesus. We have sung about Jesus, haven't we? We've talked about Jesus. We've prayed about Jesus. But there's coming a day when we will be face to face with Jesus. And Paul said, when Jesus comes, those of us who belong to Him, we're going to be with Him in glory. And not only will we be with the Lord in glory, but we will be with His people. Are there people from the past that you look forward to meeting in eternity? Can you imagine having the opportunity to sit down with Joseph or David or Jeremiah or one of the other great prophets of God, Samuel? Or what about having the opportunity to sit down and talk to one of the biographers of the life of Jesus, Matthew, who was a tax collector, or John, the one that had a very close-knit relationship with Jesus, or Dr. Luke, what about Paul? To sit down and talk to the Apostle Paul? It might be that there are some people that you've known and loved here, and they're now in eternity. And you look forward to being with them again. Could I tell you honestly, there are some people that I haven't seen in a long, long time. Haven't had the opportunity to hug them. Haven't had the opportunity to talk to them, to eat with them, to just enjoy good times with them. But I know this, there's coming a time when all of God's people will be in this beautiful place that we call heaven. Not pie in the sky stuff, this is real stuff, isn't it? And the Hebrew writer said that those of us who belong to the family of God, we're looking for a city. And he said that city has foundations. And he said the builder and maker of that city is God. So what about you? It's a challenging life to be a believer in this day and time, isn't it? But the good news is we can rise above the world and be victorious. Because as Paul said, when Christ who is our life, when He appears, we'll appear with Him in glory. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, could I encourage you to come to Christ? What do you need to do? Believe Jesus to be the Son of God? To repent of all your sins, to walk away from a life of sin, to die to that way of life. And then to confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. To be immersed in water, to rise, to walk in newness of life, as Paul talks about in Acts 2, verse 38, Romans 6, 3, and 4. And then to be faithful. Maybe you're here today, you need the prayers of the church, we'd be happy to pray with you and for you. Listen, God will abundantly pardon. Won't you come as we stand and sing?